and the many participating in each spirit of sancti. Amen. So St. Cyril of Jerusalem, uh, father and doctor of the church, uh, feast day, uh, March um, 18th. So he was um, is an important uh, figure in the early church. Uh, he's again, one of the fathers of the church. Uh, they are so called uh, because of a witness of their teaching and dogma, which proved the historicity of the church. And St. Cyril was uh, born in Jerusalem in 315. So that's very early on in the church, and we have a record of his writings. Uh, we know what he taught, and, and that is uh, valuable because, as of course, as the centuries go on and on and on, and the church develops her dogma, there are people who attack dogma, right, and say that these are inventions at a later date. So we have uh, men like St. Cyril of Jerusalem. Uh, they're a witness, they're a testimony that way, way back early in the, in the 300s, the fourth century of the church, these doctrines are being taught. And so that's, that's the, the, the value of, the, of, of those fathers, their, their utility. And so we'll see that today with St. Cyril. So as I mentioned, um, they born in, in the year 315 and was very young, became Bishop of Jerusalem in 348. He would, he would only have been th about 33 years old at that time. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, one of the fathers of the church and the, the, the writings that we have from him were not when he was bishop, but actually from when he was priest and, and maybe even deacon. Uh, so he was, he was um, uh, as, as deacons do, uh, he assisted in the, um, the sacraments, of course, the mass, but also in the instruction of converts. And this is where he would, uh, his, his writings are about, is he has, um, they're called the, the um, what is it, I think the, um, uh, the instructions of St. Cyril, uh, 25 lessons that he would give to catechumens, right? basically the, 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 uh, kind of a first catechism lesson. So St. Cyril, um, these are divided into, into two parts. So 18 lessons he would give to converts before baptism, and then um, some of seven or so lessons after baptism. And um, in these, he talks about uh, original sin, uh, the nature of Christ, his sufferings, his passion, the resurrection, uh, the life of our Lord. So there's, 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 there's very much in there uh, that is, as, as I mentioned, that witness to tradition. And the way he speaks is, is different. It, it's not like a theological treatise. It wasn't something that uh, was written in a high, kind of elevated style. It was just a priest talking to his people, right? Talking to the people he was bringing into the church. And that, that kind of sets these, these apart from other... Um, you know, like memoirs or, or um, uh, again, treatises. Uh, this is a little bit different than other writings we have from that period, and for that reason, very valuable. Um, let's see. It says that he wrote uh, in a simple style, full of quotes from Scripture and examples from Christ's life. And also, he, he weaves in and out of his lectures uh, uh, problems at the time. He talks about the, the troubles, evil influences from paganism and, you know, problems from, from the Jews still in the city and other heretics and Arianism at this time. Um, so again, very, very uh, valuable um, witness to tradition. Uh, but also it would serve him very well later in life um, in that, you know, when, when because again, he, he dealt with Arianism, the, 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 this heresy that was, that was uh, growing in the church. And there were so many Christological heresies, so many heresies surrounding these um, higher points of the Trinity and the relationship of the different persons to each other. This is all very high level theological stuff. And what you find is that every heretic was a high level theological person, brilliant intellect, usually an archbishop, a lot of power and a lot of influence. That's the problem. That's what inclines people to heresy, is not so much a love of the truth, but a love of themselves. Uh, 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 um, you know, their own intellect and how many people are, are, can be dazzled with, with their theories. I mean, occasionally you, you do find these heretics that, that repent, but much of the time it's not sincerity, it's power that impels men towards these, uh, these evils. Uh, but when you have someone who has had to take high level things and bring it down and explain it to uh, 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 simple people, they tend not to go off the rails because they see it, they see the truth. They're not concerned about brilliant um, explanations and dazzling people. They're concerned about, I want a simple person to understand God. I want them to love God and I want them to know the truth. And that was St. Cyril. Uh, so he, he spent that, he was a deacon, he was a priest, he was teaching people. 
He was bringing them into the faith. He was making the mystery of Christ accessible even to the lowest person. And so he didn't fall into this. Um, and, and, and we see kind of that he was, it was expected to. Uh, one of his supporters when he was named our, uh, Bishop of Jerusalem was uh, Acacius of Caesarea. And Caesarea was this coastal city in, in um, you know, that region, uh, very influential, very powerful. And Acacius, again, was a powerful bishop. He, he consecrated uh, Cyril, Bishop of Jerusalem, and was expecting him, uh, St. Cyril, to support Acacius in his Arian, uh, promoting the Arian heresy. St. Cyril didn't do that. So, I mean, he had brilliance, you know, he had influence, but he also had a love with, for the simple. And that's, I, you know, I think one of those things that would, that kept him uh, from being, um, what would you say, that uh, enticed uh, into, into that, uh, into that, uh, that, uh, that uh, heresy. So this didn't sit well with Acacius, right? This other bishop who had consecrated him, who had had him elevated to the, be the bishop of Jerusalem, and then now you're not supporting me right, in what I want to do. So there was this tension from, from right away. So St. Cyril leaves behind the life of a simple priest. Now he's a bishop, and now he's got to deal with um, bishop problems. Um, and so after, let's see, two years after Cyril was appointed bishop, uh, Acacius has him brought before council on trumped up charges. Um, St. Cyril refused. St. Cyril refused for, uh, for a number of years. He would not attend the council, knowing that it was uh, for spurious reasons. Uh, but Acacius had him uh, condemned and exiled anyway. And so St. Cyril, just a few years after, after taking over at Jerusalem, uh, has to take refuge elsewhere. Goes with another bishop. And uh, so he's with this bishop in exile for a year. Uh, but then this bishop um, was at the Council of Seleucia, and St. Cyril was uh, declared innocent, restored to his uh, position in Jerusalem, and then Acacius was deposed from Caesarea. So a little re reversal of fortunes. Acacius, however, appealed to Emperor Constantius, who, remember, was an Arian himself, and then a year after that, Acacius was restored to Caesarea and Cyril was deposed from Jerusalem. And so then it's, okay, we're back, we're, we're back to where we were before. And then the following year, the Emperor Julian came into power, Julian the Apostate, and he brought back all exiled bishops. So now St. Cyril is back to Jerusalem. So you see this, this like circus. Right? This is what happens when politics get involved, when these powerful men are trying to, to, rather than promoting the kingdom of God, are promoting their own ideas, right there. So St. Cyril is, he's exiled, he's restored, he's exiled again, now he's restored again. Uh, this, this is very tumultuous. How, how, can, you, how can you govern uh, um, you know, a city when you're in and out and people don't know, are you gonna be here, are you not gonna be here? Would, like, who, who are we following? So St. Cyril has been banished twice and he spends uh, six years in Jerusalem trying to bring uh, order back, back to the ecclesiology uh, of the city. Uh, but once again, uh, Emperor Valens, after Julian the Apostate dies, Emperor Valens is, uh, comes to power, and he again is Arian. And so he banishes St. Cyril, and this time Cyril is away for another 10 years, away from Jerusalem, and not returning until the year 378. Uh, so St. Gregory of Nyssa actually came to help St. Cyril of Jerusalem in restoring orthodoxy to that city. And um, it was difficult. They found that uh, the faith was sound, like people weren't really succumbing, succumbing to heresy, but morals were lax. They found a great deal of corruption in the city. Uh, so um, St. Cyril also, let's see, a few years then after returning to Jerusalem, in 381, he would attend the Council of Constantinople. And this, this would uh, repeat the condemnations of Arianism. Uh, also, it, it, it established that principle of um, the homoousius, the how the, the son is related to the father in the Trinity. And remember too, with this council, uh, there was a difference between Western bishops uh, and Eastern bishops. In, in the West, they were using Latin, they were describing uh, the Trinity and we using certain terms. In the East, they weren't using those terms, they were using different terms. There was almost a huge schism and break uh, in the very early church. Uh, but St. Cyril was one of those um, bishops who understood enough that, okay, we're not using the same terms, but we do have the same understanding. And, and so it was St. Cyril was able to, among those bishops, who convinced the other Eastern bishops 
that it was it was this was an orthodox uh, uh, creed like the Nicene Creed. Um, this is the, the Homoousion uh, doctrine. Uh, a big big controversy in the early church. Saint Cyril helped to prevent a schism uh, very early on. Uh, so a few years after this, uh, 381. Uh, St. Cyril would die in the year 386, um, having spent, um, I think, more time in exile than actually in being bishop of his own city. Um, but we see, uh, you know, kind of like St. Patrick we, we saw yesterday, how the difficulties, uh, what, what St. Patrick endured earlier in life helped him later on as a bishop. And so we see that too with St. Cyril. Uh, it wasn't necessarily difficulties in early life, but it was that catechesis. It was spending time at the lowest levels of the church with the simplest people uh, where St. Cyril developed his love of scripture, love of life, the life of Christ, and his love of explaining difficult truths to, uh, in a simple manner to simple people. And that's what sustained him, right? Uh, throughout his, his, his course as a, as a bishop, not being swayed by temptations to power or influence, but also uh, the lessons he, he gave to, to, to uh, the catechumens on forgiveness, on bearing with sufferings well, on the Beatitudes about how we have to be willing to suffer all for Christ. And so we had multiple opportunities, all, all when he was bishop, to forgive his enemies, not to succumb to anger, not to want revenge, not to you know, bemoan his fate, not to be frustrated by what he couldn't do in his own diocese. Um, so he lived it. He, uh, he first he taught, he taught the truth, and then God asked him, okay, now prove it. Prove the truth by enduring suffering well. And we all should expect that. None of us should expect that, that, that this life is going to be easy. And, and who, who was St. Cyril persecuted by? It was his own Catholic fellow Catholic bishops. Right? And, and, and what, what do we, we feel like today? We're being persecuted by our own church. That's not new. Right? And, and, and we shouldn't think that, that um, fall into uh, uh, despondency or sorrow or, or uh, what is it, nervousness. Uh, God knows what's happening. Right? He wants us to suffer well. He wants us to be an example to others, not just around us now, but even years and years in the future. Who knows how long the world will last, but the faith has to be passed on somehow, and it's going to be through us. Right? If, if we do live through this period, you know, the church does continue. We're going to have to be, people should be able to say to us, right? Saint so-and-so 300 years from now will say, what about those people back then who were living? Think about how hard it was. Think about the kind of faith they had to have. But they did it, right? And we can do it now. This is always going to be a problem in the church. Uh, we should learn to simply um, accept it. This is where we are. This is God's church. And I want to be faithful to him. Have a simple faith. Have a simple love. That, will be, that should be sufficient. No, it will be sufficient to get us through anything. Let us pray to St. Cyril uh, of Jerusalem uh, for that very faith and that, and that love. God bless you all. The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.